I really enjoy noticing which native species of vegetation deer are browsing on at different times of year. Maybe during the hunting season or when I'm just out in the summer doing some work. Recently, some of the guys noticed where deer were eating on Queen Anne's lace. You may also know it as wild carrot. It's a kind of a stemmy plant, four or five feet tall, has a big white cluster of flowers right on top. I've always considered it a noxious weed. It's not native to this part of the world. And I rarely see deer eating on that plant, but it doesn't spread much, so I don't really get too excited about it. But learning that deer were feeding on it, well, that really piqued my curiosity. Daniel went out because just coincidentally, we had a Reconyx camera positioned on some native vegetation and a good buck come by and started browsing on some Queen Anne's lace. So Daniel said, heck, let's figure this out. He went out there and clipped off parts of the plant close by to where that deer was feeding, the same part of the plant, and we sent it in to Walter's Ag for a forage analysis test. And we got it back. I was surprised in some ways. Now the crude protein, nothing to write home about. About 12%, acorns are seven or eight. But this time of year, many native species and certainly food plot crops have 20% or more crude protein. So that wasn't the attraction. I go on down that list and I noticed a couple things that really struck my fancy. The fat content, was almost 5%. Now, fat content is critical. This time of year, boy, deer are seeking energy. Fat is energy. You know, it's early for acorns. The earliest corn is in the milk stage. The really early corn may be starting to harden and deer are hitting that hard because they're seeking energy. They're kind of switching from protein to energy. They're also needing a lot of calcium. At this time of year, late July, early August, they're pushing a bunch of calcium in those antlers called the hardening process. Calcium's kind of replacing the protein that built the antler, the antler structure through the summer. And Queen Anne's lace, gosh, 2% calcium. 2% of every bite they take is calcium. That's a high level of calcium for many native vegetation species. Looking at that fat and calcium, I'm not surprised the buck was using it this time of year. I prefer planting blends of species in food plots versus a monoculture or a single species. And there's a couple exceptions. Maybe you have enough food plot real estate, enough land dedicated to food plots that you could plant a cornfield for that late season hotspot. I don't have that here. Or maybe the deer density in your area, the deer population is low enough that you can grow soybeans in a relatively small plot. And boy, there's not much prettier than a field of soybeans and big old antlers sticking up while they're eating out there. But if that's not the case where you hunt, blends are probably a really good alternative. But sometimes I plant a blend of species during the summer to warm growing season of plants that deer don't even like to eat. And people go, why would you do that? Well, I'm getting ready to explain why. This summer, I had a blend of plants and some of the food plots where deer tend to browse really heavily. And some of the plants in that blend, I know deer aren't gonna eat. One would be sorghum and another's a warm season brassica. It's pretty bitter actually. Well, I wanna show you how much deer don't prefer that. Remember deer are very selective feeders. They're gonna eat the best, best is nutritional quality and taste and leave the rest. So for example, if I had a full field of something they really liked, and within three or four weeks, deer ate it to the ground. I'm just left with a bunch of weeds. That's not very productive. So I had a blend, and this summer, one of the big components was sorghum, just a pretty generic sorghum variety I included in there. It's gonna get six, eight feet tall, big root structure, really breaking up that soil, pulling nutrients out of ground, but deer don't eat it. And that sorghum will be terminated or mature, either way, depending on what I do be laying on top the soil, I never disc it in, and then slowly release the nutrients it captured during the growing season for the next crop. I also put a brassica in there. Now you think about a brassica, even a turnip leaf or a radish leaf, that's not the brassicas I used. They're really, really good at pulling nutrients out of the ground, but those big leaves, they break down real easy. Think about laying a leaf of lettuce out in the sun, boy, in a few days it starts curling up and decomposing. Well, the combination of the two gives me a rapid release, kind of a starter fertilizer for the next crop and a slow release fertilizer. Let's look at a few things. I actually pulled samples off both those, sorghum and brassica, and had Walter's Ag do a forage analysis. 
And on the sorghum, my goodness, there's 21 plus percent crude protein in there. You're thinking, deer are diving on it. But that leaf is so tough, got a lot of lignin content in there, and the stalk's big like a corn stalk. Deer just don't touch it. I never see deer eating on a sorghum leaf unless they're really hungry. Moving on, remember 20% protein, and then it's got a bunch of calcium and phosphorus in there, and that's gonna be released right on top of the soil. When it starts decomposing, go right down to the root. So that next crop, it's like a slow release fertilizer. And that sorghum plant, of course, it makes a lot of tons of biomass per acre. When we plant through there with the Genesis and then lay it down with the crimper, tremendous ground cover. It keeps those fall weeds from coming up. Our food plot crop will grow right up between them, but that sorghum's acting as a tremendous weed mat. Now the brassica, they decompose really quickly. Guys, the crude protein on there was 26 plus percent. Imagine that, 26 plus percent, and deer aren't touching it, goodness gracious but it's got 2.6% calcium, it's got phosphorus, it's got a lot of good stuff in there. Deer aren't eating it, it's extracting it from the soil. When we plant that new crop and terminate that existing crop, it's gonna decompose rapidly, go right to the root system of that new seedling and provide high quality fertilizer for the next crop. I really enjoy learning how to improve the quality of food plot crops. And that quality may be palatability or protein or just tonnage produced. Experimenting is often the best way to learn that. And this year I had an opportunity to do an experiment, if you will. Now it wasn't a true experiment, I didn't design it, but a couple of fields, we put three tons per acre of poultry litter just on a couple of fields out of all the plots here at the Proving Grounds. The other fields, well, we've been using the buffalo system for several years, and I know the nutrient quality is pretty good. Now, on that field with the buffalo system, no nutrients, no lime, no fertilizer, nothing has been added in seven plus years. And on the other field, well, the buffalo system hasn't been there near as long. It's a relatively new field. We just cleared it out not that long ago. So this year, I added three tons of poultry litter. I had an opportunity to buy some poultry litter, and I'll tell you, I got a pretty good price about $35 an acre, so three, $35 a ton, I should say. So three tons per acre, gosh, I got $105 an acre just in fertilizer. Now, poultry litter is better than synthetic fertilizer. There's organic matter in there. Poultry litter has all kinds of trace minerals, and it's just better than synthetic, which a lot of synthetics made out of petroleum, and it costs a lot more. So I'm gonna go to field A, which has just been the buffalo system for seven plus years, and field B, relatively new food plot, but had three tons of poultry litter applied. So field A, the crude protein of these soybeans are planted within a few days of each other, everything else same, same species of soybeans, all that, was 32.16%. Imagine that, 32 plus percent crude protein on a field where I'd spent no money on lime or fertilizer in seven plus years. Going to the field where I just put down three tons of poultry litter. And remember that only costs money, but that big truck is compressing the soil and doing other things like that, was 33.52%. So 32, 33, that's just the leaves we picked. There's no significant difference there in the amount of protein, they're the same. I go on down to crude fat, which is important. Now soybeans don't have a lot of fat. I'm talking to vegetation, not the beans themselves. And the field with no additives, the buffalo system field, 1.95. The field where we put the litter, 1.96. Again, no difference. Uh, look on down here at total digestible nutrients. That's kind of how much of the plant can be digested versus going out the back end, okay? The field that's been buffalo system, 67.13. That's cooking with gas, 67% of the plant the deer consumes stays in the deer at least for a while versus rushing out the back end. And on the other field where we put the litter, 68.29. Again, no significant difference. Why am I sharing this with you? I just wanna give you a little confidence. If you start the buffalo system, and often I have people do a soil test and put 75% of the recommended nutrients out the first year and 50% to second and 25 to third, by the fourth year, they should be cruising. The rotation should be providing all the nutrients necessary. 
think about the money savings growing the same quality of forage. Combining last fall, what we call a growing season burn, August and September, and this spring, March, April, depending on the weather, what we call a dormant season burn, we burned about a third of the proven grounds, and that third was kind of center and southern portion. And then we started looking at trail camera pictures throughout the summer, and we started noticing a trend. Where we'd done that big burn, those burns were almost contiguous, so a pretty big unit all turned black between last fall and this spring. The deer got some ticks on them, but not near as many on average as the area where we haven't burned in a couple years. I gotta tell you, the deer in the area where we haven't removed that leaf litter or knocked on that native vegetation where we hadn't burned in a couple years, those deer are loaded with ticks. Now, prescribed fire is a tremendous tool to improve nutrient quality of early succession plants and also to reduce the amount of ticks. It's not going to eliminate them because, you know, you burn 50 acres, let's say, or 100 acres. It's gonna start greening up with that first rain, probably be the best forage in the area, and deer are gonna pour in there. But all of a sudden you burn several hundred acres, deer aren't quite getting to the center. There's so much good vegetation around the edges, they don't have to venture out in the center of that burn, and that area can remain tick-free longer. When you consider some areas like New York and some of those northeastern states where it's either illegal or almost illegal to burn, that leaf litter gets awful deep through the years. And leaf litter, it holds moisture. It's perfect tick habitat because desiccation is what kills most ticks. If their skin gets dry, they die. Well, it gets so dry on top, those leaves just get way down that leaf litter. Getting some moisture, they're doing just fine. Prescribed fire can provide much better quality native forage and reduce ticks. And by reducing ticks, it's more pleasant for us to be on the timber. And also deer can express much more of their genetic potential. Bigger antlers, more fawns. We don't have all those blood suckers on them throughout the summer.